Hello, my name is Dr. Elliot Hirshhorn of New Life Functional Neurology and Endocrinology here in Greenville, South Carolina. I'm a board certified chiropractic neurologist and I focus on helping kids. Kids with focus and attention problems, inability to control outbursts, kids that have ADHD or similar symptoms. What makes us different is that we're trying to figure out what are the underlying dysfunctions in these kids that's causing these symptoms so that we can put together a customized plan and solution that specifically addresses the causes so that we see changes in symptoms, but changes in symptoms that are long lasting. Let's briefly go over what we're going to discuss in today's video. We're going to talk about actual patient cases, real kids, real parents, real families seeing real results. You'll even hear from a mom in her own words. We're going to talk about the five secrets to natural effective therapy for ADHD. And most importantly, we're going to talk about how we can help you and your family specifically. Let's go ahead and get started. I want to share with you two very different stories. The differences are not in how they begin, but really how they end. Both Zach and Max, who I'll show you in just a second, were dealing with symptoms of ADHD. Difficulty with focus, difficulty with attention, difficulty with behaving at school, not able to focus at home to pay attention and do homework, difficulty making friends, things like that. It's the choices that were made in regards to therapy options that really started to diverge these two different stories. So let's talk about Zach first. Zach's parents chose to put him on medication, stimulant medications, first Ritalin, and really that was the only choice that they had, and so that's why they made that choice. They didn't have the options that we're going to talk to you about today. In a little bit, I'll also talk to you about the fact that with these stimulant medications, it leads to a lot of side effects, including behavioral issues. So Zach dealt with that. He got in trouble with the law. He set dumpsters on fire. He spray painted other people's properties. Ended up going into use of other substances, things like tobacco, alcohol, drugs, marijuana, things like that. Because of all of these things, he continued to do very poorly in school. He didn't have the grades to go to college, but he had a very passionate love of his country, and so his option for career was to go into military, and he happily chose that. Now, we're going to come back to Zach in a little bit once we're done our discussion, and we're going to talk about where he ended up in life having gone down this road of the stimulant medications. But I want to also talk to you about Max. Max was dealing with the same issues, traveling down that same road of ADHD. But again, his path diverged from Zach's because his parents had other options besides the medication, and that was their goal. They didn't want to put him on medication. They found our program. They went through our program, and we're going to come back and talk about the results that Max had from our program and compare them to where Zach ended up as well. So keep both of those young men in the back of your mind as we go through the rest of our discussion here on the video. While you're thinking about both Zach and Max, I want to now move into the five secrets of naturally addressing ADD and ADHD. Secret number one is that ADHD and other neurodevelopmental diseases are literally an epidemic. Let's talk about the statistics to back this up. So ADHD is the most common learning and behavioral disorder, and it's the most common chronic disease in kids. What does chronic mean? Well, let's think of what the opposite of chronic is. An acute disease is something like a common cold that you get in the wintertime. You have it a week, maybe two weeks, it goes away, you're done with it. A chronic disease is something that lasts for a long time. It's an ongoing battle. In adults, things like thyroid disease, diabetes, neuropathy, those are common chronic diseases in adults. In kids, the most common chronic disease is ADHD. In fact, 11% of all children and 20% of high school boys will get a diagnosis of ADHD, which is an, a 41% increase since 2003. Two-thirds of all of those that receive a diagnosis end up taking a stimulant medication, so things like Ritalin, Vyvanse, Adderall, Concerta. Sales of these stimulants have doubled in the period of 2007 to 2012 from four billion to over nine billion dollars so this is a huge huge money maker for the pharmaceutical companies 
10,000 two to four year old children are being treated with psychostimulants. In my opinion, at this age, between two and four years old, there's so many other things that we should be attempting to do to help these kids besides putting them on medications. There are a ton of side effects, including the risk of developing these other common chronic diseases as these kids get older, including diabetes. These kids have a 300% increased risk of diabetes when they're on these psychostimulant medications. Unfortunately, 35% of these kids that have an ADHD diagnosis never finish high school. 52% abuse drugs or alcohol. 19% go on to smoke cigarettes compared to just 10% of the general population. 43% of ADHD boys will be arrested for a felony by age 16. And parents, it doesn't just affect the kids, parents of ADHD children divorce three times more often than those of kids that do not have ADHD. So these are some of the side effects um, in terms of lifestyle and behavior that also result from use of the medications, not necessarily the, in the um, disease process itself. The CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, actually calls these neurological disorders a major health threat because one out of every six kids entering school will be diagnosed with a neurodevelopmental disorder. Their traditional approaches have not changed in many years. What, what I mean by that is that in the medical system, they have a standard of care. They have guidelines. When you have an ADHD diagnosis, you take stimulant medication. The guidelines have not changed but yet the, the numbers and incidents of kids with these diagnoses continues to rise. So what we're doing is the same, but the results are not getting better. In fact, they're getting worse. So what did Einstein call doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results? He called that insanity. So why are we still doing it? Secret number two is that the current approach is failing our children. Let me go over the typical ADHD story that we see in our office. It's usually one of two situations. Now, first of all, the kids uh, have very typical types of symptoms, just like I talked about with Max and Zach, lack of focus and attention, poor grades in school, behavioral problems, not able to make friends. So two situations happen. Either you visit your primary care doctor and then they refer you to a specialist, or they take care of it themselves and they prescribe a psychostimulant medication. The ones I've listed before, Ritalin, Adderall, Vyvanse, Folkland, Concerta. And sometimes these provide a, a valued um, benefit for a short time. Um, but there are side effects. I've gone over some of them already. Some of them can also include changes in the child's personality. And we've had kids tell us, I just don't feel like myself being on the medication and they don't want to be on it. Okay, so that's scenario number one. You're on the medication, and if your child's on it, that's okay. We can work with that. Don't feel guilty about it. You're investigating other options. You're in the right place, and it's okay. Second situation is that maybe you see these symptoms in your child, and you just want to avoid these issues um, and taking the medications for these problems altogether. You want to just avoid the medications right from the beginning. And no matter which situation you're in, if your child's on the medication or not and you want to avoid it, we can help in either situation. So be encouraged in that. Now, sometimes when parents come into us, they want us to label their kid. They want the diagnosis. You haven't had the diagnosis. Here's the thing. While the diagnosis is sometimes important, what is most important to me is to help your child so that their brain functions better so that they don't have these symptoms anymore and they can have a better outlook for their future. So my goal is not to slap a label on the child. And really when you think about the labels, what good are they anyway? So for example, ADHD, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder. Now if I tell you your child has that, what good does it for you? Nothing. All you know now is that your child has an attention problem and they're hyperactive. Well, you told me that when you came in. I didn't do anything new for you. It's like going to the emergency room with chest pain and they say, oh, you have a diagnosis. Guess what it is? It's chest pain disorder. Not very helpful for you. So while we are going to try to categorize where your child is so that we can help them properly, my goal is not to slap a label on them. It's to get them the help that they need and we'll do that for you. Now, in the traditional medical standard of care, the guidelines say that if you have a diagnosis of ADHD, then you're going to get a medication, and that's going to be a stimulant usually, Ritalin, Concerta, whatever. They did studies back in the late 1990s that showed that there is benefits and about a 70%
of children notice this benefit uh, up to a year. They did the studies for a one year follow up and they found even at one year they're noticing improvements in the symptoms. They're able to focus, they can pay attention, the grades are getting a little better. Okay. What they did not do was see, well, how are these kids doing after one year? So after that study came out, that's when the big push came for these medications and the usage of them and the prescription of them and the profits from them really skyrocketed after that point in the late 90s. Well, the same study authors redid the study in the mid-2000s. This time they followed them long term. And what they found was that after three years, after you know beyond one year, up to three years and beyond, there are no positive benefits taking the medication. In fact, at this point, all the children are dealing with are the negative side effects. So not only the behavioral issues going into drugs and alcohol, but also things like decreased appetite. And we see this in kids even before the one year mark. Difficulty sleeping. So a lot of times we'll see kids on a medication to help them sleep at night to counteract the difficulty with sleeping based on the medication to begin with. Abdominal pain, headaches, ticks. Ticks is another common one we'll see all the time different things can impact the child's physiology when they're on this medication causing these different symptoms and then as i mentioned before it just changes their personality so parent says he's just not himself anymore she's lost her spark child recognizes themselves hey i just don't feel like my old self anymore i don't like to be on the medication we hear this commonly long-term studies have been done that shows that the use of central stimulants so that's stimulants for the brain Ritalin, Vyvanse, Adderall, for more than one year was significantly and pervasively implicated in the uptake of regular smoking, daily smoking in adulthood, cocaine dependence, and lifetime use of cocaine and stimulants. Literally, these psychostimulant medications are in the same class as cocaine in terms of how they impact your brain, so they become a gateway drug it's very very important to understand that and understand the risks when taking them ADHD as I mentioned is the most common chronic condition in kids so what I want you to do is I want you to think of what are two things that you could do or stop doing for your child right now that could improve their condition most likely the first thing to come to mind is not taking another medication right you're thinking, okay, maybe there's something I can do with a diet. Maybe we can do an exercise. Maybe we can do something, not a medication, that could be beneficial. And that's probably why you're watching the video. You want something different. Well, Dr. Horowitz, who's a medical doctor, he says that modern medicine is excellent at providing care for acute diseases, things like strep throat, acute bronchitis, pneumonia, urinary tract infections, surgical emergencies. The medical system however lacks an understanding of and treatments for a myriad of chronic diseases including ADHD in kids yeah they can provide some symptomatic benefit in the short term but in the long term it does not address the underlying cause of the problem so that you don't get long-term improvements and so we have to step outside of this traditional medical standard of care of just using stimulant medications and we have to do something different and that is what we're going to be talking about through the remainder of our conversation so secrets one and two it's an epidemic the current approach is failing the reason why the current approach is failing is because it does not address the actual underlying cause of ADHD which is actually a dysfunction in the brain unfortunately a lot of times we'll see people commenting that oh if you just you know discipline your kid better they'll be fine and discipline is important but not if there's an underlying dysfunction it's not the most important thing the most important thing is figuring out where that dysfunction is and putting a plan together to address it I hopefully you agree with that all right let's talk about the brain in particular where we find these dis dysfunctions first of all let's talk about what f normal functions typically occur and so right over here you'll see the frontal lobe and in the frontal lobe is where we have centers for the ability to focus and pay attention the ability to control impulsive behaviors this is where we have a lot of our executive function reasoning judgment etc Behind it here in the parietal lobe is where we have our sensory input. And so a lot of times kids with ADHD will have difficulty with spatial awareness. So they're in line with a friend 
uh, multiple friends at school and they're not staying in line they're drifting out of line they're bumping into kids they're poking kids in the head and that becomes a problem with the child's actual ability to make friends because kids just don't want to be around them back here in the occipital lobe we have visual processing and so sometimes the inability to focus and pay attention is not necessarily due to a problem in the frontal lobe but it's a, due to a problem with the visual processing. So they're seeing things around them on the board, in a book, etc. But the processing of that is messed up here in the occipital lobe. And so they just can't process the information they're seeing or reading. And so they just drift off because they just don't understand what's going on because of visual processing issues. In the temporal lobe here is where we have memory. And so conversion of short to long term memory happens here in the temporal lobe. The back part of the brain underneath is a cerebellum, also involved with spatial awareness, involved with balance and coordination. So if the child's a little clumsy, you may see some issues there. And then the brainstem is where we have control of breathing, heart rate, and those types of um, vital issues. Okay, now in that area of the prefrontal cortex that we talked about, we have those key functions of impulse control, reason, judgment, They've done MRI studies, functional MRI studies of kids with ADHD, compared them to kids without ADHD, and they literally found that those areas of the brain are smaller in the kids with ADHD. So this is what's causing them to be um, prone to drift off, to make sudden outbursts, to use poor judgment, because literally those areas of the brain are underdeveloped. They literally cannot function to capacity because they're, they're, the structure is just not there. The tissue in that area is thinner and smaller, and more importantly, there are fewer connections. So it's the connections between one area of the brain and another that allow the complexity of function. Scientists believe that it's these variations that are impacting these kids' symptoms focus, attention, impulse control, etc. So we have to look to these particular parts of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, the occipital lobe, wherever it may be, we want to identify specifically where are the dysfunctions and then we want to make sure that we get those areas functioning better again. How do we do that? Well, any neuron, which is a brain cell or a nerve cell anywhere else in your body, needs two basic things in order to survive and to thrive and function well not just mediocre so you need fuel that comes in the form of oxygen and the food that you eat and that is maintained by diet and nutrition or lifestyle and so some of the things that we will do as part of our program with these kids is make lifestyle changes diet is key as the parent or the grandparent or the guardian, it's going to be on you, the burden's going to be on you to make sure that they are implementing the dietary changes that we recommend. Um, also the nutritional supplements. And we do this based on testing, so we'll do specific testing to make the recommendations based on that. The other thing that the neurons or the brain cells need to be healthy and thrive is activation or stimulation. You can think about it as uh, with your muscles. If you don't use your muscles, you sit on the couch all day, they're going to waste away. Use it or lose it, basically. The same thing applies with the brain, and although the kids are using their brains, we can use extra utilization or activation specifically to help to stimulate the particular part of the brain that's not working as well. So let's say the right prefrontal cortex in your child is not functioning well. There are specific neurological activities that we can have the child do that specifically target and activate or stimulate the right prefrontal cortex more than any other area. That will provide the extra activation or exercise literally of that part of the brain to get it to function better while at the same time we're working on diet and nutrition. There's also neurofeedback that we can use and we'll talk about that and how it can be very very specific in regards to not only identifying the particular area of the brain that's not working well but also providing specific therapy and activation to that part of the brain as well. It's pretty fantastic. The idea that we can actually change the brain is called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the idea that we can get the brain to create those new connections. Remember I said it's the connections that are important? The more connections we have, the more complex brain function we have. It's not the number of brain cells because actually 
newborn babies have more brain cells than we do as adults. What happens is over time some of those brain cells are pruned away, they die off, and then it's the complexity of the connections that develop during neuro neurological development that creates the complexity of function as well. What makes us different from other places that you might get care for your child is what we do specifically to address these particular areas. So we're making sure that we're doing diet and nutrition. And you can do that with a nutritionist. You can go and they can put you on supplements. They can give you a diet, and that's fine. We do that here. You could go get brain-based therapy. There are other brain-based therapy clinics um, and educational places where you can get that. There are places you can go get neurofeedback. There is no other place in our area that does all three of these. Lifestyle changes with diet and nutrition based on testing. Brain-based therapy specific to a functional neurological exam. Neurofeedback specific to a QEEG. And we'll get into the details of all that. We're the only uh, clinic in the area doing all three of those things. Secret number four, as I've already alluded, is that effective brain therapy must include proper metabolic support. So what does that entail? As we said, lifestyle changes, diet, nutrition, ensuring that the child has a proper nutritional foundation. They have the nutrients, the vitamins, the minerals to produce the energy needed for brain function, but also we want to make sure that we're eliminating things that are going to be detrimental to that as well. So a lot of times the question is asked, is it the genes or is it the environment? And the answer to that question really is yes. We can have a predisposition to a genetic component to all kinds of different chronic diseases, including ADHD. But whether or not those genes are turned on and off is dependent upon exposure to things in the environment. And that's a concept called epigenetics. So yes, you could have genes that predispose you to a certain ailment, but whether or not those genes are expressed and turned on and off has to do with how you've been influenced through environmental exposure, and that's epigenetics. Let me give you an example. When testing the umbilical cord blood in newborn babies, they have found over 287 different chemicals just in the umbilical cord blood. So these kids, before they're even born, are being exposed to a huge, huge number of chemical insults in the form uh, of different toxins in their umbilical cord blood. 180 of them have been shown to cause cancer, 208 of them cause birth defects or abnormal development, and 217 of these chemicals are known to be toxic to both the brain and the rest of the nervous system, which is what we're dealing with in terms of an underlying cause in these symptoms for these children. Pesticides can also have an impact, and they've done studies and showed that kids that have higher levels of pesticides were two times more likely to have ADHD. So then the question becomes, well, how do we eliminate pesticide exposure? Eating organic, is it helpful? Well, the studies show that children who eat organic had one-fifth the level of pesticides, you could also say, 80% less pesticides when eating organic and so really it reduces the exposure level to negligible. There's a negligible risk for exposure to pesticides and other chemicals when you do eat organic. Other types of pollutants found in the environment when kids are tested and the levels of these pollutants are tested it's found that they have a three times greater likelihood of having ADHD when they have higher levels of other pollutants as well. What other types of environmental factors are there? Well, if you look at this picture, this is becoming an all too common scenario in our society, and we're all guilty of it. I'm not laying the blame on anyone in particular, but this is very common, whether it's between parent and child or mom and dad. One person's doing one activity on a screen, another person is doing another activity on the screen and there's really no social interaction there's no physical activity going on and so what has been found is that video games TV smartphone usage any type of increased screen time is associated with an increased risk factor and incidence of ADHD 
And so the more screen time, the more likelihood uh, for ADHD. And they measured that in this study at age two, five, and then in adolescence as well. And so studies are showing that it's not only a correlation between increased screen time and ADHD, but a causal relationship. So increased screen time causes ADHD based on the information they found in the study. What about in the foods that we eat? Artificial colors, flavors, preservatives, common preservatives, things like sodium benzoate, which you can find on the back of a soda can, just look, it'll be there. And food colorings, they've been shown to increase hyperactivity in kids, even if the kids were not hyperactive to begin with. So they took two groups of kids, ones that were hyperactive, ones that were not hyperactive. They gave them these foods that have preservatives and food colorings in them, and they all became hyperactive, regardless of whether they were to begin with or not. So what we're eating and what is in the food that we are eating is having an impact on attention in hyperactivity in kids. In fact, in Europe, they actually label warnings on these foods for the parents. Let me show you. So I took this picture myself. It's the back label of a soda can. And in case you can't see it, we'll blow it up. But there, after the dye, it says, may have an adverse effect on activity and attention in children. You think the FDA is labeling this in the United States? No, of course not. You haven't seen it. But in Europe, they're realizing that these things are having an impact based on the research, so they're putting the warning labels on the food. For whatever reason, it's not being done here, but now you know it is an important thing to take into consideration. What about food sensitivities? So you've probably heard of gluten before. Different types of food sensitivities can cause an underlying inflammatory response chronically. Every time a person eats a food that they're sensitive to, they, uh, their immune system mounts a response. It causes a lot of inflammation. It's like having an infection all the time. It can get to the brain and impact brain function, which is what we're trying to work on here with these kids. And so we do test our kids for food sensitivities. You can have a food sensitivity even if you do not have a gastrointestinal complaint. So you could be gluten sensitive and not have any cramping or bloating or distension or diarrhea or constipation after you eat or at any time. You can have no GI symptoms and still have a sensitivity. So it's very important to test it. There can be other nutritional deficiencies as well, lack of good fat. So um, sometimes we'll s substitute or supplement omega-3 fatty acids for our kids. Uh, we'll look and see if there's an iron deficiency, zinc, magnesium, especially if kids have anger issues or anxiety, we may see a need for a magnesium supplement. And so it's important to look for these types of issues. Now in regards to parenting skills, parents uh, um, and parenting skills also have an environmental influence on the child and it can have an impact on the outcomes of what we're doing. So we don't specifically help with this, but there are a lot of resources that we can point you to in the right direction if you ask us for help with that. We're not going to step on any toes in that regard, um, but there are resources available if necessary for you. And ultimately, I have to tell you that we can fix the brain of the child and get it to function better and see improvements in symptoms, but we do not fix eight-year-old boy. So when the brain's working better, your child's still going to be an 8-year-old boy or an 11-year-old girl, and they're going to do things that are normal for their age group. I hope that makes sense for you. Now, we've been answering the question, is it the genes and the environment? In the beginning, I said the answer is yes, and sometimes it is, in fact, the gene. And there's a gene in particular that we pay a lot of attention to. It's called MTHFR, stands for methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. You don't need to know the full name of that. But if you remember MTHFR, you may hear that again in the future. Let's talk a little bit about what it does. So MTHFR is responsible for a multi-step chemical breakdown process called methylation. Methylation is extremely important for about 250 to 300 other biochemical processes. So this step of methylation happens pervasively throughout your physiology. It's important for turning on and off genes. It's responsible for making brain chemicals, brain signaling chemicals like dopamine and serotonin, which impact mood. It's responsible for, for breaking down hormones so that we don't have a toxic buildup of hormones. It's responsible for activating your immune system, the natural killer cells and the T regulatory cells, which help to regulate your immune system. 
It's responsible for creation of myelin, which is the outer covering on your nerve cells, which helps to conduct the signals properly. Myelin formation continues into early 20s, so all of the kids that we deal with are still dealing with myelin formation, and so if they have an MTHFR defect, it's going to have an impact on myelin formation processing of chemicals and toxins or detoxification which normally happens in your liver if we have an MTHFR breakdown this could cause uh, a backup or a lack of function in the normal detoxification process and you could see a buildup of different toxins and chemicals so because it's so pervasively implicated in so many different physiological processes it can have an impact on a lot of different diseases as well and so you can see the the exhaustive list there neurological disorders hormone regulation problems autoimmunity but here we're obviously focusing on kids with neurodevelopmental disorders ADHD being the primary thing but it does have an impact on the others in the spectrum as well and so uh, if we find it necessary, we will test for this and provide adequate therapy to address the issues that we do find. Once we have a good metabolic foundation, the fifth secret to natural effective therapies for ADHD is effective brain therapy must include neurological activation. We have to activate or stimulate the parts of the brain that aren't working properly to get them to function better. Remember, activation or stimulation is one of the two things that brain cells or neurons need in order to work well. So there are two ways that we do this. Uh, the first way is brain-based therapy. The brain-based therapy is based on a functional neurological examination. During that functional neurological examination, things that we look for are imbalances side to side, front to back. We try to localize where the dysfunction is occurring. Many times what we find is that there's a dysfunction in the right frontal lobe and left cerebellum for kids that have ADHD. That's a general pattern. It's not always the case. But let's say that based on the testing we find that, we're going to give exercises that specifically target right frontal lobe, left cerebellum more than any other area in the, in the brain and that will provide the activation or stimulation that you need. You can see here on the screen this is an optokinetic strip or tape and we can use that as a, as a type of an exercise that taken in a particular direction will stimulate those parts of the brain. Other ways we can do that simply is if we want to stimulate the right brain we could have the child sit on the right side of the classroom and that would allow all of the sensory input, the speaking from the teachers and the other kids all of the visual input will come in and mostly from their left side so it will go cross over neurologically and stimulate the right brain preferentially over the left brain providing that extra activation or stimulation to the area that we need now don't go to your teacher your child's teacher and tell them to sit on the right side of the room it is, it is uh, prescribed based on neurological testing so we got to figure out what is best for your child because if we do the wrong thing it could actually potentially make things worse so another thing we do in the neurological evaluation is we want to see are there primitive reflexes still present so primitive reflex is something like the suckling reflex where if you touch a child's a newborn's cheek they're going to gravitate towards that touch they're looking for food that happens naturally it happens reflexively it's not a voluntary movement it's involuntary same thing when you put your finger in an infant's hand they will grasp it there is no conscious decision to do that it's involuntary it's reflexive these things don't happen as adults you don't touch an adult's face and expect them to gravitate towards your finger reflexively um, they don't grasp your finger these reflexes disappear naturally as a part of normal neurological development and so if there has been a problem with neurological development in the first one to two years you may see some vestiges of these reflexes still present and we will test for that and if we find them that's going to be a key part of the rehabilitation part of the program in which we prescribe for your child the second part of the neurological activation comes in the form of neurofeedback and this is what I want to spend a majority of the rest of the time talking about is what is neurofeedback how does it work and what does it accomplish the goal of neurofeedback is to take unhealthy dysregulated brainwave patterns and transform them into normal healthy organized patterns 
When we do this, the brain is more stable, it's better able to operate, it functions better. Literally, these areas of the brain that we target and train grow new connections, that concept of neuroplasticity that we've talked about, so they function better, and because they are structural connections and structural changes we've made, the brain changes last long term, as do the results in changes in symptoms as well. As I just mentioned, they demonstrated based on functional MRI that neurofeedback after the therapy shows improvements in structure and then therefore function in the areas related to attention, the prefrontal cortex in particular, for kids that have ADHD. So how does it work? First, all of our neurofeedback is based on guidance from quantitative electroencephalogram or QEEG. It's really kind of a window into brain function and if you think of an EKG you've heard of that that's measurement of electrical activity of the heart you see the little squiggly lines going across the screen if you're watching a, a TV show like ER or something like that well EEG is the same thing except we're measuring electrical activity of the brain brain function normally produces an electrical current and we can measure that with an EEG. So we put sensors on the head, we take the raw data, you can see a picture here on the right of a child being measured. These little sensors are measuring the electrical activity, you can see it's showing up here uh, on the computer screen. We collect all that raw data, we send it to a database of other children their age, that average database, and we compare the data from your child to the data of the average child their age and we look for areas of dysfunction and if there are areas of dysfunction compared to the average that correlate with symptoms that your child's experiencing focus attention problems outbursts impulsivity those types of things then those are the areas that we're going to focus on with the training in regards to neurofeedback the types of brain waves that we are measuring are four basic kinds. There's delta, theta, alpha, and beta. So let's walk through what each of these is. Delta brain waves are produced during sleep. It's associated with the release of growth hormones. So we see a lot of growth happening in particular in kids and repair and healing happening as well. So we have to have good delta brain wave function in order to have restorative, refreshing sleep overnight. And so if we see issues in delta brain wave function, it could be reflective of problems with sleeping and healing and restoration at nighttime. Theta brain waves are produced when you're just about to fall asleep. They're associated with creativity and memory retrieval, and so this is why we often get our best ideas just as we're about to fall asleep. We get creative, we remember things just as we're about to sleep because that's what these brain waves are associated with. When these particular brain waves become dysregulated, however, and we see elevated level, levels of theta during the waking states, it can be associated with distractibility, inattention, daydreaming, those types of things. We will commonly see elevated delta and elevated theta in kids that have ADHD. Alpha brain waves are uh, associated with a sense of inner calm or peacefulness and meditation. These are often produced when the brain is idle. Um, when we see a dysfunction of alpha waves, it can be associated with emotional concerns, anxiety, depression, lack of motivation. We'll see difficulty in the alpha brain waves. Also when we have some learning disorders in particular in the left frontal areas. And then beta brain waves are the most complex in terms of their function. They are produced when we are awake, when we are alert, when we are focused and problem solving and logical and attentive. So hopefully as you're watching this video, you're producing lots of beta brain waves, learning and paying attention. These are produced in the outermost layer of your brain. It's called the cortex. It's about the, <clears throat> excuse me, it's about the outer one eighth of an inch of your brain. It's the part that you see when you look at a brain and it's actually thinner and smaller in kids that have ADHD so they produce fewer beta brain waves than normal so that's why they have problems with these executive functions in terms of paying attention and focusing etc. Looking at this diagram delta theta alpha and beta you can see on the left with delta and theta reds and yellows means overactive on the right here where you see 
blues and dark blues, those are underactive. So this is a classic pattern for ADHD, overactivity of delta and theta, underactivity of beta. That is ADHD classically. And that's the type of patterns that we're looking for when we do the evaluation on our kids. Once we figure out what the issues are in regards to brainwave patterns, we put together a specific program for training those areas to function better. And it's going to involve producing more or less of a certain brainwave in a particular area. So if we go back to this picture, we want these brainwave areas to be less overactive. So we want to down train delta and theta. And then these areas with the beta brainwaves are underactive, so we want to uptrain beta brainwaves. And that's the parameters that we set into the computer. So during a training session, which you see on the right here, this is an actual training session in our office. The patient is hooked up to the computer. We're measuring brainwave activity in real time. The brainwave activity is coming into the computer. It's being shown on the display here. The computer is matching his brainwave activity to the database. Is his brain doing what the database says it should be doing in the particular areas that we're training? Is he producing average delta and theta, good, delta, uh, good uh, beta brainwaves? If he is, he gets a reward feed in back through the TV screen. The reward is the activity that he's doing, watching a video in this case, continues to play. So this will play, the screen will be bright, the audio will come up, he'll hear some audio feedback in his ears as well. So we're not inputting anything into the brain directly, this is a feedback loop. It comes from the brain into the computer, back through the TV and the audio in the headphones. So the patient's brain is literally controlling the playing of the video based on whether or not the brain is doing what it's supposed to do. When it does what it's supposed to do, the patient gets a reward. The brain learns over time, hey, if I do this behavior properly, I get this reward. And it's going to lay down connections, newer connections, neuroplasticity, to cement those behaviors literally, physically, structurally in the brain so that it'll continue to do that even when we're done the therapy. One of the best parts about this training is that the changes that we make can be long-lasting if not permanent. It's been demonstrated that with sufficient neurofeedback sessions the brain actually remodels itself structurally as I've mentioned several times and that is called neuroplasticity. Some of the really cool things about neurofeedback other than the fact that it gets great great results and we'll go over the research that shows that is that it's painless, it's drugless, it's non-invasive. The only side effect there is is that the the trainee, the child, will usually be tired afterwards because it's literally like exercising the brain. So on the way home in the car, kid usually falls asleep. Parents don't usually complain about that, so that's a good thing. And most importantly, obviously, it's effective, and we'll get into the specifics with regards to the research on that in just a couple of minutes. I want to show you a brief clip of a segment that I did on a local news show called Your Carolina. On the show, I discuss with the hosts, Jack and Megan, what we're doing during an actual training session. And as you'll see in the clip, we have a patient of ours, and we go through what the actual training session looks like, and you'll be able to see on the screen what I'm talking about in regards to the screen dimming in and out in response to the feedback from his brain. So take a look. Hey, welcome back. Yes, you're Carolina on Veterans Day, and you know, uh, ADHD is a topic close to my family. I'll right. I may tell you a little more in a minute, but we've got the good doctor here, and we're going to ask him some questions. Dr. Elliot Hershorn, you are New Life Functional Neurology and Endocrinology. That's correct. Yep, we're located in Simpsonville on Main Street. Well, welcome. And ADHD is, uh, again, being treated by you without medicine, and you're being successful. Yeah, so this is a therapy that's rated with the highest level of recommendation by the American Academy of Pediatrics, right. and it's, a, it's called neurofeedback. And so basically what we do initially is we, we do a, a, what we call a brain map. It's an EEG of the brain's electrical activity. Mm -hmm. I showed you this last time that we talked. This yeah. is the report that we get back. Can you hold it? Yep, absolutely. And so this is a typical pattern for ADHD. We have high delta and theta waves and low beta waves. That's typically what we'll see with ADHD. So the goal with the therapy is to downtrain these high waves and uptrain 
the low waves. And when we do that, the brain, which is really the cause of the issue, is a dysfunction in the brain. The brain right. functions better and the symptoms go away. So is that me, what Jackson is doing? Yeah, right that's now? what Jackson's doing right now. So let me show you on the computer screen. Um, we're actually monitoring his brain in real time, so you can see the brain wave activity there. When his, we oh, have this it. This is real time, like yes, this right is his there? brain right now. Oh, and you've got wires hooked up to his temple. Yep, uh, to his frontal front, lobes, front and that's typically where most of the issues are for ADHD yeah. is in the frontal lobes. Yep, and so we're we're basically looking to um, make sure that these waves are going down and these waves go up, and when it does that, the movie continues to play that he's watching. So if you watch the movie, um, you can see it dimming in and out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when it dims out, his brain's not doing what I want it to do based on the parameters we set in the computer. But when his brain does what we want it to do, it'll come back up and it'll play. So it creates kind of an intrinsic reward system. It's called operant conditioning. And that literally retrains the brain. And they've done MRI studies wow. afterwards that show that Very the areas changes. of the brain that, that are uh, focused and attention oriented mm -hmm. actually have new connections in them. So that once we're done with the therapy, usually we're done. We don't need to do it anymore. Well, but the wow. main thing is, Jackson, are you having any fun? Yeah, he's like, don't interrupt my movie, Mr. Jack. I don't want to watch it. Now, is this like a kind of therapy, like what he's doing now? Would this just be done in your office, or will his parents do this with him at home too? So this is done in our office, but we have other brain-based therapies, exercises that stimulate different parts of the brain that we give to the parents to do at home, as well as dietary and lifestyle mm -hmm. changes um, in addition to those things. So it's not just this, but this is the main component of what we do. Well, a lot of people treat it with medicine. I had a son, ADHD, he's a grown man now, but mm -hmm. we treated it with everything from Ritalin to Adderall. And there, there are side effects to every medicine. Yeah, that's right. And my brother had ADHD, so I grew up in a family that, uh, understanding the dynamics mm -hmm. of those things, and he was on Ritalin, and so I understand you know, the side effects that come with those. And sure. they are beneficial, at least in the short term, but long term, it doesn't actually address the brain problem. Mm -hmm. It just stimulates it temporarily. What we're doing here literally fixes the brain so that long term you don't have to deal with the medication side effects and you get literally the results can be permanent. Is yes. this something you would condition a child to by using this every week? Or, I mean, so typically we do it twice a week. Okay. Twice um, a week. So the, the therapies build on one another, so we don't want to yeah. go too long in between those, those treatments. Now when would someone come see you? Maybe when a parent first thought that their kid had ADHD? Or? Yeah, so symptoms like not being able to focus on attention in school, pay attention in school, behavioral issues. Um, some parents come and they're already on medications, they want to try to get off, mm -hmm. and we can work with the prescribing provider to do that once we get the brain fixed, or they come, like Jackson's case, he wasn't on medications, parents wanted to just avoid that altogether, and so any of those situations would be a good time to And come. he's been here before the show, yeah. and how good has he, I mean, he's Jackson, been you're a good man. sweet I would, little boy. Would, I would like to show your face. I know, right? he's really, it's super <laughs> So you saw in that clip the process of an actual training session. Now I want to talk to you about the actual effectiveness of long-term neurofeedback therapy. You may not have heard of neurofeedback before, but it's been around for a long time. In fact, its first research for ADHD using neurofeedback was back in the 1970s. But it's been stuck in university-based labs because it does require sophisticated computer equipment, which was cost prohibitive to have in a private practice until more recently. But in all of those years, it has demonstrated a 76% success rate for ADHD. Now, adding on top of that, the other things that we do from a brain-based neurological perspective and then the metabolic support with dietary and nutrition, our success rate goes well above and beyond that. A couple of comments about the effectiveness of neurofeedback in the research. A principal investigator in 2006 used functional MRI imaging before and after neurofeedback, and he said that there is mounting evidence that neurofeedback can significantly improve cognitive functioning in ADHD children. This is one of my favorite quotes. It's by Dr. Frank Duffy, who's a professor and pediatric neurologist at Harvard Medical School top of the line in terms of academic medicine. He was asked about the effectiveness of neurofeedback and he said, in my opinion, if any medication had demonstrated such a wide spectrum of efficacy, it would be universally accepted and widely used. So what he's saying there is that if any medication worked this well, everyone would be using it. It's that effective. The journal Opinions in Pediatrics calls it the most effective solution for ADHD, and the American Academy of Pediatrics gives it their highest level of support, rating it as a level one best support therapy for ADHD. We can talk about effectiveness of neurofeedback in the research, 
But really what matters is, is it effective in changing people's lives? And so I want to show you a testimonial about an actual family and how we were able to change their lives based on what we do in our office. Hillary had issues with insomnia, uh, mood swings, oppositional defiant behavior, as well as decreased attention. We had done diet changes, we had done supplements in the past, but we would see improvement and then we would end up seeing regression at some point, um, even when we adhered to everything strictly. Um, so we never really knew necessarily what caused these changes or the regression, so I just felt like something was missing and that we needed to look for something in addition to what we were already doing. I found out that New Life did offer neurofeedback and I had read how that would help a lot of kids with the symptoms that my daughter had. So, um, and I love the fact that New Life is integrative. So we were gonna get to continue with the diet um, and focus on that. We were gonna get to continue with supplements and find the right supplements that would work for my daughter. So that's all I needed to know and I was sold on coming to New Life to try to find help for her. Amazing, amazing changes. So. Um, again, we were desperate when we got to New Life because things had been going well and then we noticed regression and for that particular time the regression was pretty bad. So I just, I didn't know what to do or, or where to go at that point. So um, once we started with New Life, the quality of her sleep improved dramatically. So not only is she sleeping and staying asleep, but it's restful sleep. So I know the quality of her sleep is so much better. When she wakes up, she's not tired. She's able to function at school and at home. Um, her moods are stable now. So that's always nice. It's always a good thing for the child and the, and the family. Um, her, the oppositional defiant disorder, I can honestly say is 100% gone at this point. So very, very happy and excited about that. Um, you know, she's just stable. Her moods are stable. She's happy. Um, she's having fun. Before we came to New Life, uh, she was very sad, um, did not have a lot of energy. She was always tired, um, really just, even though she played, you could just tell, I mean, it was a different child. She just wasn't really enjoying herself. Her quality of life was not anywhere near as good as it is now. So lots of wonderful changes and improvements. New Life has been amazing. I love the fact that everyone here wants to listen and really understand. And so it's not just like a cookie cutter type treatment. Everything is specifically designed to the individual. Um, and so I love being able to talk to a provider and for them to understand and for us to work together as a team and come up with a good plan that works. So just that alone has been wonderful, of course, along with the amazing improvements that she made, so I couldn't ask for more. I just think that Dr. Hershorn is wonderful. I think the staff is wonderful. Everyone is very caring, um, very helpful. And again, new life has given us a new life. And I'm just glad that I have my daughter back and that she's happy now. Don't hesitate, make the decision and do it because your life will change, your child's life will change. Um, because when a child suffers, the whole family suffers. So don't wait, just go ahead and do it um, so your child can, can be happy, your family can be happy, and you'll definitely see wonderful results. Being a small part of making such remarkable, life-changing stories like that is what makes it so rewarding to do what we do in our office every day. Let's go ahead and review the five secrets of natural effective therapy for ADHD. Number one, this is an epidemic. Number two, the current approach is not working. And the reason why is number three, the underlying dysfunction is neurological. So with the chemical treatment of a medication, we're not addressing the underlying structural neurophysiological problem in the brain. So how do we do that? We have to provide the brain with the three things that it needs. So number four, we're providing the metabolic support, the fuel, the nutrition, the activate, the nutrition and the oxygen. And then number five, fifth secret, is that we have to provide the brain specific activation or stimulation. It has to be in the particular areas of the brain that are dysfunctional, and that's gonna be different from one patient to the next. 
Now that you know more about what we do, the next step moving forward is to see if it's a good fit for you and your family. And the best way to do that is to make an in-office consultation appointment. There's no cost or obligation for you to do that. What we'll do during the consultation is answer three basic questions. Number one, what are the underlying dysfunctions that are causing the symptoms and the behaviors that your child's having? Number two, can we help you with that? So we'll answer the question, do I think you and your family are a good fit? If you are, we'll make recommendations for the evaluation process, and then we'll answer question number three about the costs associated with that. Now, in the typical retail costs of these types of tests could be upwards of five, six thousand dollars. We're able to keep costs down, and you can look at a range of anywhere between five and seven hundred dollars for those initial evaluation costs. One of the most common questions we get about the care that we offer in our office is, does insurance cover the cost of care? Unfortunately for most people, in the majority of cases, the cost of what we do in our office is not covered by insurance. And the reason why is because what we do in our office is different than what is offered in the traditional medical standard of care. So let me give you a couple of examples. Let's say you have a child with ADHD. The traditional medical standard of care is if you have folks in attention problems, you have a diagnosis of ADHD, the guidelines say you go on a stimulant medication, Ritalin, Adderall, Vyvanse, Concerta, whatever the case may be. Let's say you're an older adult and you have neuropathy and you have burning and tingling and numbness in your feet and maybe it's caused by diabetes while well, you go on a diabetic medication, that's in the guidelines. And then maybe you go on a cholesterol medication, that's in the guidelines and then they give you gabapentin for the neuropathy symptoms. That's all within the guidelines. What we do is completely different in our office. We do much more extensive testing to figure out what the underlying issues are. The therapies that we offer in terms of diet and lifestyle, nutritional supplementation, brain-based rehab is different than the medical standard of care. Insurance covers what's inside that medical standard of care, not what is outside. So let's take a little bit closer look into what I'm talking about and give you a couple of examples. The way the current insurance system is set up is it's designed to pay for things to keep you alive. So if you're in a car accident, if you have a heart attack, if you have a stroke, if you have a life-threatening illness, it's going to pay for the care necessary to sustain your life. But it's not designed to pay for things that enhance or prolong your quality of life. So let me give you an example. You see the picture there on the right? That's a receipt from a hospital bill from a patient. They spent six days in the hospital, and if you can't see it, it cost over $153,000 for just six days in the hospital. If you calculate that out, it's roughly over $1,000 per hour to save this person's life. Once they got out of the hospital, then they're pretty much on their own in terms of quality of life. So insurance isn't designed to improve your quality of life, it's designed to save your life. Think about it in terms of car insurance. So car insurance is designed to replace your car if you get into an accident. Car insurance does not pay for routine maintenance like an oil change or a tire rotation or a brake service. You're responsible for the routine upkeep and maintenance of your car and really you need to make the same type of an investment for your quality of life and your health as well. This is a quote from the Medicare guidelines. It says that a treatment plan that seeks to prevent disease, promote health, and prolong and enhance the quality of life or therapy that's performed to maintain or prevent deterioration of a chronic condition is not a Medicare benefit. So quality of life issues, preventative health services, they're not Medicare benefits. Private insurers like Blue Cross Blue Shield, Cigna, Aetna, they follow Medicare guidelines as well. So it's not designed right in their own language for quality of life issues. No patient in our office has ever said at the end of their care plan after achieving their goals that they regretted making the investment in their health. In fact, a couple people have commented on it, including Mr. Henson, who said it costs some money, but boy, is it well worth it. And Susan Whitmire said, because without your health, really, what do you have? And that's a really profound statement. Your health really is an investment. It's not an expense, but it can become an expense if you don't take time to invest in it now. And that's really true. If you don't invest in yourself now in terms of your health and well-being, you're going to see a higher 
cost later in life, not only in terms of money, but in terms of in uh, time and energy taking care of yourself later when you could spend less doing it now. In fact, they say in the research that for every dollar of preventative care, you can save $15 of chronic care later on. Before we wrap up the video, I want to come back to the two young men that we talked about in the very beginning. Remember Max and Zach? Well, Max went through our program. He did so successfully. He's seeing huge improvements, huge strides in his ability to focus and pay attention and complete homework and make friends. His life is literally in a new, completely new direction. Remember we said Zach and Max, they're going down this parallel path. Well, Max and his parents, they chose this particular option, what we do in our office. He's on a new course in life, and his future is extremely bright. Zach, again, parallel pathway, same type of symptoms. With Zach, parents chose to use medication, not because they had two options, but that was all that was presented to them. And so Zach ended up dealing with a lot of the typical issues that we see, um, all the statistics that I went over um, with uh, drugs and alcohol and uh, different types of crimes, whether it be you know, vandalizing property or, or things like that. Well, uh, Zach went on uh, to serve in the military. As I mentioned, he had a love for country. And so he went in to serve in the military. He did a tour in Iraq. Through that, he had several broken relationships. He suffered TBI and PTSD during his time in the war. And unfortunately, shortly after he came back, he did complete suicide on August 29th of 2014. Now, I am not directly connecting his ADHD to his suicide by any means. What I'm saying is that Zach was going down this path, same as Max. Max, his family went in this direction. Zach's family went in this direction because that was the only option they had at the time. This led to a series of events in Zach's life, going into the military, etc. Hard road, and it ended in suicide. The reason why I share Zach's story is because Zach was my little brother. And I do not want one more family to have to go through what me and my family have gone through, dealing with, from the way back in the beginning, the, the dynamics in the family associated with having a child with ADHD and then going down that hard road that ultimately led to where he is. And so I would encourage you once again, consider giving our office a call to schedule a consultation to see if we can help you and your family. The number is 864-757-8500. I look forward to talking with you soon and I look forward even more to helping you and your family to have a new life.